We're remaking royalty as we give you Needle King. Around since Generation 1, it is fitting that this ruler is older than many of the subjects in the game of Pokemon today. It's always been an imposing Pokemon, used symbolically as such by similarly strong trainers like Giovanni and Gary Oak himself. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's get right into it. We're examining if Needle King was as regal as its name suggested in that ultimate of battlefields, the competitive scene. And so we ask, how good was Needle King actually? And speaking of kings, we should try to save ours because this video is sponsored by Manscaped. Did you know one man every hour every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst men ages 15 to 35. April is National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, and Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help you take care of your nether region. Manscaped sent me the cordless and waterproof Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Trimmer. The dual skin safe blade heads from the 4.0 have since been upgraded to the longer, wider, and rounded trimmer blade, and now comes with the interchangeable foil blade that helps you achieve a more precise finish. And of course, the Lawnmower 5.0 includes an LED light to help you easily navigate through tricky regions. It also contains a constant RPM motor, which allows you to trim without a loss in performance, even if the battery is low. The Lawnmower 5.0 also has up to a 60 minute runtime on a single charge. It's very easy to travel with because of the travel lock feature and a handy carry in case that comes with it. And as part of their partnership with TCS, Manscaped will be donating $50,000 to the Testicular Cancer Society. Visit manscaped.com TCS to learn how to check yourself for early signs of cancer or share their funny educational check yourself video to help save lives and balls. And if you want to save balls and also support the channel to help us produce more content, you can use my promo code FALLSWIPE for 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. And thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Needle King's weaknesses to Psychic and Ice, as well as a lack of anything interesting to offer offensively, meant it stood nary a chance in its inaugural generation of OU, or UU for that matter, which feasted on these same weak points, as well as its water weakness in a metagame ruled by Tentacruel. Once it got all the way down to NU though, Needle King was quite good. Its vast offensive move pool on both sides of the physical special spectrum, alongside solid attacking stats and good speed, made it a strong mixed attacker. It was incredibly difficult to switch into because of its colorful coverage options, hitting nearly everything in the tier super effectively. For instance, while Moltres and Charizard were immune to Earthquake, each of Needle King's three other coverage moves hit them super effectively, making it immensely difficult to pivot around its moves safely. Needle King's Stab Earthquake packed a legitimate punch against neutral targets as well, most notably seriously clocking the likes of Mr. Mime. Needle King was so threatening, it three hit KO'd every Pokemon in NU at worst. It was also effective at hitting the field safely thanks to its superb electric immunity, allowing it to enter with impunity against the tier's plethora of Thunderbolts and Thunderwaves. Using such common moves as entry points was invaluable for a Pokemon so capable of threatening just about everything. It was really excellent at punishing Electrode, while before fellow riser to UU Clefable left here, Needle King also enjoyed switching into its Thunderwaves. Plus, if one's own Mr. Mime was able to Thunderwave the opposing Mime on the switch, Needle King could switch into the retaliatory T-Wave and threaten with Earthquake. Needle King was especially terrifying against weakened teams in the late game, where its speed allowed it to leverage its super effective coverage into guaranteed KOs, like against Golem and the many waters in the tier, Cobbletops, Kingler, Blastoise, and Seedra. Plus, if push came to shove, Needle King was no glass cannon. Its capacity to take a hit increased its threat level, since even if it didn't quite reach the KO threshold against a target, it was almost surely going to withstand the hit they responded with. Now, Needle King was far from flawless. Useful as its electric immunity was, its weaknesses to Psychic and Earthquake were also also serious hindrances, and the popularity of the moves meant while Needle King was capable of threatening much of the tier, much of the tier also threatened it in return. Additionally, its speed, while good, wasn't quite top tier, so it had to be ready for dangerous counterattacks from the likes of Venomoth and the Fires. All this really meant, however, was that using Needle King required heads up play, and ideally, some paralysis support. And if it received that, the benefits were massively rewarding for its trainer. Its overlapping coverage was excellent in allowing it to threaten huge portions of teams, with opponents struggling to safely pivot around its moves given how everything was constantly on the verge of falling into KO range against it. Overall, Needle King had a successful debut generation.
Needle King leaned into the many changes brought about by the second generation with Aplomb, its special stat splitting in two resulting in higher special attack, making it a more apt mixed attacker, and Thunder now had a 30% paralysis rate, meaning its lower accuracy relative to Thunderbolt was far more justified for more than just its raw power. It also enjoyed the weakening of the Psychic type, as that was no longer the most hindering issue to have, and in this same vein, its fighting resistance became much more valuable in the wake of Machamp becoming a legitimate threat. The crux of Needle King's viability however, lay in its incredibly potent mixed attacking capabilities, aided by it receiving lovely kiss through an event. Combined with its superb typing that not only let it threaten a huge portion of the metagame offensively, but let it switch in easily through its defensive capabilities as it had an immunity to the thunders thrown out by the legendary electric Zapdos and Raikou, as well as thunderballs from Gengar and being immune to toxic. This meant Needle King was a significant help in playing around the most defining powerful strategies from both offensive and defensive teams and was thus a consistent Pokemon on a game-to-game -game basis, helping significantly in providing its user workable matchups against the metagame at large because it used this superb defensive profile in order to enact its offensive threat. Now, despite Needle King not exactly being a world beater in terms of meta-shattering power, it was among the most obnoxious Pokemon in the tier to switch into. Many players even called it the most annoying threat in the tier, with exaggerated claims of its brokenness. But even exaggerations have basis in truth, and the truth was that with just its standard set of Earthquake, Lovely Kiss, Ice Beam, and Thunder, Needle King was a terror, especially because of its great speed stat for the tier. With spikes and good prediction, its attacks were quickly pushed into the danger zone. It had good power, it had great super effective coverage, and it was also a great distributor of status, accentuating the danger of itself and its teammates alike. Lovely Kiss's sleep was massive with Gen 2's lengthy sleep duration, and afterwards, Thunder's great coverage that ensured water types and Skarmory wanted no part of it also came with the benefit of the great hindrance that is paralysis. Needle King even became one of the meta game's go-to distributors of freeze because against slower stall teams that would attempt to outstall its offensive onslaught through hyper bulky pokemon like umbreon miltek and suicune needle king would still find many many opportunities to attack and the odds of that one ice beam freeze it needed stacked up over time and with gsc's exceptionally low defrost rate odds were that freeze was going to stick and be game breaking as a result needle king was often paired with gengar and when it became popular jinx as part of a team-wide assault to pepper the opponent with as many freeze-induced moves as possible. They were so successful, in large part thanks to Needle King's durability, that they wound up scoring multiple freezes per game and getting freeze claws reinstated after it was briefly removed. Wait, but wasn't rest and rest calling sleep talk everywhere in Gen 2? How were Needle King's lovely kiss sleep and thunder para long-term effective against that? Well, not every Pokemon ran rest talk of course, and not every team ran rest talkers everywhere, and not every rest talker was particularly good into Needle King. Have fun trying to take on Needle King with your rest Talk Raikou, for instance. However, Rest Talk Pokemon could be annoying for Needle King at a first glance, anyway. Even its standard set could get around Rest Talk Pokemon with good play. The fact that Rest Talk Pokemon didn't control their own sleep durations, unless they called Rest, also meant even they could be less dependable. However, Needle King was not beholden to its standard set, and the obnoxiousness in facing was not just against its standard bag of tricks, annoying though that already was, but in the fact that it could accentuate its inherent qualities with its deep move pool. The most popular of such alternatives sets was Thief. With no item attached, Needle King would steal the leftovers off its switch in for itself, with the switch in's ability to withstand hits repeatedly greatly hindered. A Snorlax Zapdos Vaporeon or what have you without its lefties wasn't completely ruined of course, but it was much easier to deal with for Needle King and its team alike. Thief Needle King was so effective, it led a wave of new style of offense that provided an alternative to the explosion heavy styles popular at the time. This new style focused on spamming Thief with Needle King and others like Gengar, Exeggutor, and Jinx. It was much easier to break through opposing teams with multiple leftovers missing, and many standard stall teams struggled to not collapse under the immense pressure exerted on them. Thief was usually used on Needle King over Lovely Kiss, since it tended to be paired with other Pokemon that could sleep in its wake, especially since they'd be bolstered by Needle King luring in a sleep absorber and crippling them. Most of Needle King's alternatives were used over Lovely Kiss because of how easy it was to pair it with another sleeper, but some teams could also use Thief over Thunder, using Needle King itself as a sleeper better able to take it advantage of its thieving. One would have to be more conscientious of waters with the rest of their team, but that was more than manageable, and the rewards made the effort worthwhile. Also excellent was slotting in Fire Blast over Thunder. Needle King kept its Skarm hitting move while also completely ruining Fortress and Heracross, which were otherwise solid answers to it, and it hit Exeggutor and Steelix much harder than Ice Beam and Earthquake, respectively, making it reliable in all sorts of matchups. Needle King could also help itself bypass
has its bulkier answers through Roar, really leading into its excellence as a spikes abuser. It caused all sorts of havoc in this vein, not just through weakening its checks, but through weakening other Pokemon that were dragged in by Roar. Switch to Umbreon, take spikes, get roared. Raikou is dragged in and takes spikes, and it has to switch again, so Needle King can roar again and keep it going. Given how many Pokemon of such bulky teams Needle King threatened, like Skarmory, Mischievous, and Tyranitar, this could get very nasty very quickly, and made Needle King an integral part of systematically breaking through GSC's stall. Needle King could also lean into its ability to ward off threats like the Electrics and Gengar with the recovery of Morning Sun, and it could even act as a superb Zapdos lure with Counter, which bounced back even special hidden powers in Gen 2. It had to wait for Zapdos to be chipped a little bit, since Counter wouldn't KO it from full health, but that was just about the easiest thing in the world to accomplish with Ice Beam. Overall, Needle King was an absolutely incredible, essential, defining Pokemon in Gen 2 OU that was a major part of many of the metagame's most important moments. Needle King absolutely hated losing Lovely Kiss in the generational shift, but also really loved several mechanics changes in Generation 3. One, Pokemon no longer had their EVs maxed out across the board, meaning your average Pokemon wouldn't be bulked out and would take more damage from its attacks, and the introductions of natures meant Needle King could become even stronger or faster than before. Speaking of extra power, which Needle King really, really enjoyed, it could potentially wield a choice band to really make its earthquake sting, and it got a useful secondary stab in the strong sludge bomb, which also came with a nasty 30% poison rate. It also got an amazing new coverage move in the Psychic Shredding Mega Horn. The spike support it cherished so dearly just got better too. Previously, it was just the one layer, but now it went up to as many as three. OU was far beyond Needle King's reach this time around, but it was absolutely excellent in UU, a major threat on offensive teams. There was nothing it couldn't threaten, especially with spikes. Its go-to set was a leftovers attacker, as it loved the flexibility of being able to switch between its amazing coverage options, as well as being able to leverage its solid resist and decent natural bulk into repeated switch and opportunities. It was particularly apt at staving off electrics like Ampharos and Electrode. Spikes consistently helped it out in the damage department since it was able to hit flyers and levitators so well, and thus it wasn't a problem for it to find that extra push against its grounded checks like Kangaskhan and Waters. However, the power of Choice Band was an immediate shock to many Pokemon like Kangaskhan thinking they were healthy enough to take an earthquake, and remained a major threat even after the initial surprise. An initial surprise Prize, which was often enough to put a serious change in the game state, making it valuable already. Sludge Bomb was also massively spammable, since its hard hitting was accentuated with the weakening of its checks further through the poison rate, ensuring even resists like Gligar wouldn't enjoy switching into it. And Pokemon immune to being poisoned, steals and poisons, wouldn't want to come anywhere near Needle King's Earthquake. Not that Gligar was a Pokemon that loved the idea of answering Needle King anyway. Needle King had the major boon of being a physical attacker able to score a cold one hit KO on Gligar with Ice Beam, while other physical walls like Amasar and Soul Rock didn't want to deal with it either. So overall, Needle King's fierce attacking prowess made it a great Pokemon in advanced underuse. Generation 4's Life Orb was just what Needle King had been looking for, a significant boost to all its attacks, ensuring that its vast super effective coverage was stinging as hard as possible. Diamond and Pearl and its successors pushed the game faster and faster, and this extra power was huge for helping Needle King keep up, as was its brand new priority move, the amazing Sucker Punch. It was boosted even further by the omnipresent Stealth Rock digging into its answers and had a major advantage as a wall breaker via its own resistance to the move. Needle King's move pool was truly an embarrassment of riches that at this point, as it even had access to Stealth Rock and another new hazard, Toxic Spikes. Now, T-Spikes weren't too good in UU, as they were easily absorbed by the Tier King Venusaur, and even teams without Venusaur so often ran a different grounded poison like Toxic Croak, Quillfish, Dropion, or Skunk Tank. However, this was often done specifically to guard against those teams that did use T-Spikes, like Stall. And in fact, it was a niche of Needle King's that it could itself fill the grounded poison role. Needle King could actually function as a decent lead on offensive teams, with fast early Stealth Rock as as well as taunt to shut down setup from slower leads and bulky pokemon but its primary function was a mixture of different attacking variants that took advantage of its excellent coverage it usually attacked on the special side of things and even mixed variants usually emphasized its special attack with earth power cutting through rhyperior much more easily than earthquake and ensuring it wasn't slowed down at all by arcanine's intimidate it went mixed with superpower to ensure it was a special attacker chancy and clefable wanted no part of though it could also mess with those threats through taunt needle king's ability to cut through the common defensive cores on meta-defining balance teams was superb. No member of the Fire Water Grass Trio emblematic of the tier wanted to take it on, nor the Registeel they were often paired with. As always, Needle King was hitting a huge portion of the tier super effectively, thanks to Stab Ground backed by Bolt Beam. It could go with an all-out physical set too, though. 
Tucker Punch was a nasty surprise for all sorts of faster attackers, from Scarfers to Dugtrio. Preventing itself from being trapped was huge. To Alakazam to Scyther to slower priority like Azumarill's Aqua Jet, Invested Mega Horde also seriously stung the likes of Uxie, Mesprit, and Slowking, thinking they were safe. Now, Needle King was a fine Pokemon, but it was held back with its struggles to find a consistent set that managed to combine all the traits it wanted to pack simultaneously. It often found itself lacking, having to pick between some pretty perilous poisons, i.e. without Shadow Ball, it would really struggle against Miss Magius and Rotom, but slotting it was immensely difficult given all the other moves already vying for inclusion. Thus, Needle King wasn't the most splashable Pokemon. However, it was a solid choice on offensive teams capable of putting in work if handled correctly, and was a legitimate part of DPP UU. Needle King received the absolutely perfect ability for its game in Generation 5, Sheer Force, which removed the secondary effects of moves that had them in exchange for a stunning 30% boost, and Pokemon affected by Sheer Force wouldn't take Life or Recoil either. Both boosts combined for a massive 69% power boost. This kind of boost is impressive no matter how you slice it, let alone a boost that is immediate before any moves are used. This meant those moves Needle King already loved spamming, like Earth Power, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, as well as the possibilities of other options in Fire Blast, Focus Blast, and the new Sludge Wave were made incredibly strong at absolutely no drawback. The ferocity with which it now attacked from the special side wouldn't quite launch it into OU, where its lower speed, plethora of exploitable weaknesses, and low bulk would hold it back. Though some players would experiment with it in Black and White 2 as a sort of sheer force Landers incarnate replacement after the Genie's ban, it didn't see any serious use, much less make an impact, though its power was quite impressive even by OU's high standards. However, it fit into UU just fine. Now you might wonder, how well did this tier with a lower power level withstand hit so monstrous that they struck fear even into Ferrothorn and friends? The shocking, surprising answer, not well. There was nothing that could wall Needle King. Even if you threw the bulkiest possible special tanks at it, like maxed out Porygon 2 and Umbreon, they were unable to withstand Focus Blast with Stealth Rock up. Everything else got absolutely throttled by Needle King's raw power, and it could of course spice up its move pool further. Anyone thinking Suicune was decent enough would get rudely surprised by Thunderbolt, while teams attempting to pivot around Needle King's attacks to resist would quickly have to resign themselves to losing a Pokemon when it used Substitute on the Switch. Sometimes Needle King could even pop up Stealth Rock. But that actually brings us to Needle King's biggest issue in Yu Yu, its rivalry with Needle Queen, which was generally the better Pokemon for more teams. Queen was basically identical, but it didn't hit quite as hard in exchange for more bulk. But wait, wasn't that backwards for an offensively forced Pokemon? Don't you want it to slug everything as hard? as possible? Can't you relegate other Pokemon to hit taking? Well, yes, which is why Needle King was still an excellent choice on many teams. However, there was a reason Needle Queen rose out of RU and became UU proper through usage. It wasn't exactly left wanting for power, as its sheer force life or boosted attacks still hit very hard. And the extra bulk was in fact incredibly important because it was massively helpful for its team to be able to utilize the many perks of its typing's defensive capability. Much of UU offense was defined by fighting types, especially Scarf Heracross Cross, whose dual stabs were among the scariest late game cleaners, most notably if it got a moxie boost. Needle King simply did not pack the bulk to withstand its close combats nearly as well, to say nothing of other fighting assaults like Mian Xiao's high jump kick. In this vein, Needle Queen was also superior for taking stray hidden powers from Raikou and Zapdos. Needle King couldn't replicate this kind of ability to glue a team together defensively, while still hitting hard offensively, and thus it was the less popular of the Needles. However, it was far from outclassed, and even calling it quote unquote more specific feels disingenuous to its legitimate high ranking place in the tier. Yes, Queen was easier to throw on a team because it also provided a certain defensive stability, but not every team was going to need that. And if that was the case, you went with Needle King every time, especially because Needle Queen wasn't going to match it power-wise at all. As hard as Needle Queen hit, it wasn't the completely unwallable behemoth Needle King was. Thus, it ensured it had its own important place in the tier. Plus, some enterprising players even used both Needles on the same team. So overall, Generation 5 was another success for Needle King. Needle King wasn't much of a doubles Pokemon. Its immense frailty alongside its weakness to spread moves like Earthquake and Surf and a speed set that wasn't wowing anybody meant as hard as it hit, it was going to be very limited in what it could do. With that said, Ben Kiriko managed to rock Needle King on a sand team to second place at the UK Nationals 2012. So well done to him. But yeah, VGC wasn't Needle King's game.
With the introduction of fairy types in Gen 6, Needle King's long disregarded poison stat found new purpose. So much so that for the first time since Gen 2, though it wouldn't regain the status of OU proper, it was unquestionably one of the scariest Pokemon around. It took a while for the player base to realize its potential, but sometime into Orad, when Clefable was absolutely dominating the metagame, Needle King rose for its ability to completely dominate Clefable, and in turn, the balanced team's Clefable was on. It instantly threatened every defensive staple they packed, like Heatran, Ferro Thorn, Gliscor, Tyranitar, Slowbro, Tangrowth, Amoogus, Skarmory, Megalatias, whatever it was, it wasn't taking on Needle King safely, especially when it switched in so easily. At first, it took on Clefable itself without issue, as the popular Thunder Wave combine set was completely blanked by Needle King, whose mega powerful Sludge Wave slammed even a boosted Clef effortlessly, and had strong spam ability to it since Steels did not want to come anywhere near Needle King, and grounds were much more comfortable. This was particularly good since Sludge Wave was now Needle King's strongest overall attack attack, edging out Earth Power. However, did Needle King slow down when Clefable sets started shifting to include moves like Ice Beam and Knock Off? Not at all, as Needle King was always paired with those greatest teammates for powerful yet frail wall breakers just aching for the safe switch in, users of Vault Switch and U-Turn. When paired with Pokemon like Rotom Wash, Tornadus Therian, and Mega Scizor, often all on the same team, Needle King wasn't just finding safe switch ins against the cleft that was baited in, it was finding them against others like Ferrothorn, Skarmory, Heatran, and Gliscor. Balanced teams ruled the roost in Aura and Needle King was one of their very best threats, ensuring it was consistently useful. Sure, it wasn't nearly as useful against fast offense teams or harder stall teams, but that was on its teammates to handle. Needle King was the balanced destroyer, and it was the king. Needle King reprised this niche in Yu Yu for the fourth consecutive generation, where it was pretty much the same Pokemon. It loved taking advantage of the defensive fairy types Florges and Sylveon, with pretty much nothing in the tier wanting to switch into it. It also mortally threatened other defensive staples in Empoleon, Metagross, Gross, Doleblade, and Rhyperior, while it put quite a scare into Mandibuzz, Mega Aggron, and Crobat as well. Once again, Needle King faced competition with Needle Queen, whose higher bulk was valuable in taking all manner of hits, most notably from Heracross, Virizion, Mian Xiao, and even Mega Aerodactyl, as well as Conkelder before its ban. However, this time around, the two were about equal, with Needle King even barely edging Queen out if a choice had to be made, because its offensive superiority was incredibly important in dissecting Yu's dominant balance teams filled with bulky Pokemon like Reuniclus. It was also much scarier against the stall teams that were briefly popular, as it could go mixed to deck Blissey with superpower, leaving the rest of their team helpless. Needle King was once again a strong UU Pokemon, capping off an absolutely terrific Generation 6 for it. Fairy types and Aegislash meant Needle King had slightly more of a niche in Gen 6's VGC, though it was about as far from meta as you could get. Still, there were worse things you could bring. At least when you used Needle King, there was a strong chance you were going to seriously threaten something. It did manage to find a few placements. In 2014, Colton Liber reached 7th at the Long Beach Regionals. Jacob Hardenbauer reached 45th at the US Nationals. And in the fall of 2014 Regionals for the 2015 season, but still using 2014 rules, Trista Medding reached 13th and Justin Hayes reached 15th at Philadelphia. In 2015, Evan Ferroy reached 7th at the Oregon Regionals, and Whitney Johnson used an unusual Scarf Needle King to reach 4th at the Kansas Regionals. Overall, still not much, but a marked improvement on Gen 5 for Needle King's VGC adventure. Needle King's niche in OU wasn't quite as pronounced in Generation 7, thanks to the faster pace and strength of the tier, but it was very much there, for its same traits continued to be quite valuable. Balanced teams relying on Clefable eventually became as popular as ever, and Needle King continued to dominate it and other familiar faces like Ferrothor and Gliscor and Tangrowth once again, as well as several new ones like Celesteela and Toxapex. In fact, Needle King was particularly excellent in the fight against Toxapex because, as a grounded poison type, it would absorb any Toxic Spikes Toxapex laid down. Needle King's typing was also good against a select few offensive threats. It was especially useful at blocking Volt Switches from Assault Vest and Defensive Magirna, another staple it crushed, and was effective into Tapu Koko as well. Needle King generally enjoyed the presence of the Tapus. It absolutely slaughtered opposing Tapu Bulu while enjoying Grassy Terrain's passive recovery and the weakening of Earthquake, while Tapu Fini wasn't much better off against it. Needle King faltered against aggressive offensive teams, but its OU niche was legitimate in the continued fight against meta-defining balance. No matter which approach sets teams took, their constants tended to be destruction by Needle King, especially as Choice Band Tyranitar was much more popular than Scarf this time around. Needle King returned to Yu Yu again, where it also enjoyed roughly equal viability alongside Needle Queen once more. The metagame was much faster and stronger this time around, but Needle King kept up just fine. Despite its lower bulk, it was still able to act as a useful offensive check to threats like Zeraora, Cobaldeon, and even mono-attacking Mega Altaria, while acting as a great revenge killer against 
against Primarina, turning a major threat into a KO opportunity of its own. In a one-on-one, -on -one, it could even use its typing to ward off Terrakion, both of whose stabs it resisted, an incredibly rare trait. Mostly though, Needle King was, with the help of switch moves, using teammates like Scizor and its dominant U-turn, blasting through teams with its brutally powerful attacks as always. It was most valuable for being an incredible punisher of the mighty Togekiss, while also slicing through other staples in Rotom Heat, Tentacruel, Empoleon, Hippowdon, Mega Steelix, Amoongus, Slowbro, and Dual Blade. Needle King, like Needle Queen, struggled most when the tier took a turn from the more extreme, with fast-paced hyper offense teams and especially slow-paced hard stall coming to the forefront of the meta. Neither Needle King was especially well equipped into these, with even Queen's bulk not being that much higher so as to match the faster tempo of hyper offense. However, of the two, Needle King was the better choice, allowing serious pressure points to be created against Blissey and Articuno in conjunction with double switching and stealth rock. Especially since Needle King threatened the rest of the team so hard, it wouldn't do the job on its own, but it could be a useful tier. Gen 7 was a quieter one for Needle King, all things considered, but it remained a seriously strong Pokemon in both OU and UU, racking up yet another successful generation. Needle King still wasn't making any sort of impact on VGC and Gen 7, but its good matchups into three of the four Tapus was something, and it had a decent smattering of placements in 2018, by its admittedly low standards anyway. With it, Jens Arn Makinen reached second at the Sydney Internationals, Stefan Somo reached seventh at the Malmo Regionals, Sung Mong Byun and Ju Young Hong reached eighth and sixteenth in the Korean Spring League, and again, Jens Arn Makinen reached seventh at the Sheffield Regionals and eighth at Dreamhack Valencia. Well done to Jens, Needle King. King's biggest fan for giving it its best gen of VGC yet. Would Generation 8 see Needle King pull off its OU and UU double act for the third consecutive time? Well, consider this wisdom provided by another hat trick, Army of Darkness. Hail to the King, baby. Indeed, Needle King pulled the combination off with aplomb. Much like Bruce Campbell chainsawing his way through Deadites, Needle King's attacks cut through balance in both tiers with the same effortless force. With OU featuring the likes of Clefable, Heatran, Corviknight, Toxapex, Slowbro, Galarian, Slowking, Tapu Koko, which no longer had access to Hidden Power Ice, and Slowlander is Therian, Needle King was once again a major threat. Its biggest nemesis was its fellow king, Slow King, but Slow King was an amazing partner for Needle King as it provided it defensive scrutiny and a plethora of switches through the buff teleport. Pivoting to get Needle King in was easier than ever with Heavy Duty Boots, and other staples in Dragapult, Tornado Therian, and Tapu Koko were similarly excellent in helping Needle King out here. Tapu Koko was a particularly apt partner because it allowed Needle King to slot Thunderbolt into his moveset, and with the extra charge from Electric Terrain, it would become capable of blasting through Slow King. Once again, Needle King was a formidable threat in OU, and of course UU as well, though this time, Needle Queen's significantly improved defensive utility made it the clearly superior choice for most teams. Needle King's power was great of course, but UU had no shortage of power with the high viability of monsters like Diggersby, Keldeo, Hydreigon, Salamence, and Thunder Hysterion. And indeed, it was this high power that made Needle Queen's greater bulk more generally appealing, especially as the prominence of Chansey in the tier meant Needle King's wall breaking wasn't quite as lights out as it had been previously. In fact, Needle King matched up better against OU than it did UU. This by no means diminished what it was capable of in UU, of course. It was just more difficult to justify given the tier around it, especially since Needle King was far from being a slouch offensively. In this meta, when you could pull off much of the offensive threat while also gaining the defensive utility, you far preferred it. Having said that, when Needle King did appear, it was of course ruthless in how it slashed through many of the tier's defensive staples. Hatterene, Celesteela, Skarmory, Amoongus, Tangro, had piled on, and the extra power did make a noticeable difference in crucial matchups, most notably Slow King. Needle King didn't need to run Ice Beam nearly as much in UU, and so it could freely make the most of its extra power over Needle Queen to Thunderbolt its way past its fellow king. So overall for Needle King, the 8th generation was again great, groovy even. And that's it, so how good was Needle King actually? Well, it's had an absolutely stellar competitive career. It started off in the NU of its debut generation, and somehow it was consistently uphill from there. A combination of great innate traits and a little help in the right places from Game Freak, specifically Sheer Force in Gen 5, as well as Fairy types to feast on in Gen 6. Before that though, Needle King was one of the very best Pokemon in Gen 2 OU. Then it was a great UU Pokemon in every single generation starting with 3. This is really incredible. Gens 3, 4, 5, 6, 
six, seven, and eight all feature a viable Needle King for a whopping total of six gens of UU. However, starting in six, Needle King's also been a massive threat in OU as well, feasting on the dreaded Clefable. It's not much of a VGC Pokemon at all, but hey, neither is Skarmory. And so Needle King has been superb in the competitive scene. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Needle King? Would you buff it even more? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And thank you so much to our Platinum Tier Patrons. Thank you so much to Raven Daytona Ring, Sorazan Croxon, Stoneface Colin, Bingleton, Ray Ray, Daniel Isbeast, Glitcherton, Alex Sabo, Funky, and Chica Chihyo for their support of our videos.